Coming up on iOS Today, Rosemary Orchard and I show you how to use family sharing and set up devices for the family. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by BlockFi. BlockFi's Bitcoin Rewards credit card lets you earn an unlimited 1.5% back in Bitcoin on all qualifying purchases, plus a bonus of $25 in crypto after you make your first purchase. Sign up today at BlockFi.com slash iOS. And by Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment. Right now, for a limited time, save 46% on your first four months of Audible. That's only $7.95 a month. Give yourself the gift of listening. For more, go to audible.com slash iOS today or text iOS today to 500, 500 And by Coinbase. Cryptocurrency might feel like a secret or exclusive club, but Coinbase believes that everyone everywhere should be able to get in the door. Whether you've been trading for years or just getting started, Coinbase can help. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com slash iOS. Ah, ha, ha. Hello and welcome to iOS Today, the show where we talk all things iOS, watchOS, iPadOS, HomePod OS, TV OS, 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 OS. It is all the OSs that Apple has on offer, and we love to talk about everything you can do on those operating systems here on iOS Today. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I'm Rosemary Oshid. Hi, everybody. Hello, Rosemary. How are you today? I am excited, Micah, because this today's topic comes straight from, from Club Twit and, and the lovely folks in the Discord and indeed the Twit community. And it's always lovely when people have got questions and, you know, and it's not just a really great question we can feature in our feedback section, but really it's worthy of an episode topic. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited for that. Yeah, this is one of those topics that I think uh, sometimes people don't necessarily know the benefits of. I, I know we're we're sort of uh, teasing, but uh, don't necessarily know the benefits of family sharing and everything that you can do with family sharing. I use it. You know, I, I'm not the sort of standard family of being uh, a co-parent with with you know three children or something like that, but. I am the sort of head of household of my family and then use it with some family members that I have, uh, letting them use my huge amount of storage space and some of the other things that come along with it. Family sharing is a very powerful way uh, to get the most out of your device, I think, uh, in in so many different ways and also to, to help uh, family members who maybe are, are lower income and you know need to be able to have that storage space or need uh, access to some of these different features but aren't able to do so. So I am really glad to be talking today about family sharing and parental controls, which is sort of an even more in-depth portion of family sharing that gives you more tools, more power uh, to kind of manage the system. So yeah, let's kick things off. Uh, Rosemary, what's the first thing we want to talk about today with family sharing? Well, I think we should probably start with giving people a little bit of an overview for those people who've forgotten what family sharing is or what family sharing includes, because family sharing over the years has really grown. And I know originally for me, family sharing was the good old Rose gets a shiny new device whenever Apple releases it. And then she goes and she gives the old one to her mom or her dad or her grandmother or whoever it is who's next in line for the device. Um, But family sharing nowadays is not just a case of, you know, passing down your old devices as much as we love to do that. Um, But but it's also sharing all of these things that you you get from Apple. And it's not just app purchases or music purchases. It's also the services that are included, like Apple Music, Apple TV+, Plus, um, Apple Arcade, uh, Apple News+. Plus. Uh, if you've got Apple Card, then there's family sharing for Apple Card as well, where you can actually share a card with people um, and, and so on and so forth. And there is just a lot involved here that I think maybe people have missed out on some of these updates over the years because Apple have kind of just sort of snuck it in under the radar to an extent um, with things like, you know, a family photo album and by default, everyone in a family shares their location with each other and things like that. You know, if you, if you weren't, you know, actively participating during the setup, 
you might have missed things like that. Absolutely. Um, in fact, I can show you some of the stuff that uh, I share as part of my family. Uh, and folks might not know, there was a period in which Apple allowed developers to add their subscriptions to the family sharing setting. So all of these apps that I have, apps and in some cases their channels as part of Apple TV, Anyone who's on my family sharing plan is able to take advantage of this. They can use and watch AMC Plus, Apple TV Plus, Paramount Plus. Um, I don't know why. I guess, oh, wow, look, I've got a subscription to two of those independently. So now I know I'm wasting money. I can change that. Mm -hmm. uh, Showtime, Apple Music, um, which means that each person gets what is essentially a subscription to Apple Music, which is very uh, incredible. Uh, Apple Arcade as well. Apple News Plus, which is the news subscription that allows for viewing magazines. Uh, then I've got Drafts. I've got Home Run. And I'm, I'm not going to read through all of these, but some different apps that I have here that if one of my uh, people in the family were to download one of these apps, they would also have that subscription, as well as Apple Fitness Plus, which is awesome. Uh, location sharing, which we'll talk about in a minute. Purchase sharing, which is uh, the ability for a uh, for family members to kind of use one point of purchase for everybody in the family when they buy. It goes to that, and then iCloud Plus, which is the service that allows for uh, storage space, but also um, individual uh, custom email domains, and some other things, including iCloud's private relay service. The other ones that are here are Apple Cash, Ask to Buy, and Screen Time, which I don't have turned on because uh, two out of the three of those are really for uh, kind of a, a parent-child relationship, where Ask to Buy, which we'll talk about in a moment, lets you uh, confirm whether someone can purchase an app or an in-app purchase. Screen time is for monitoring the uh, monitoring and limiting how much time someone can you know have on their screen. And Apple Cash, which lets you actually set amounts of money that you can share with your uh, your your children. Or I mean, you could set it up however you want to, uh, and and be able to give you know uh, a certain amount of allowance or something like that. Uh, but the the main features here. Um, are all of these where you've got apps and services that are able to be shared with the family. And as long as they're on that plan, they're able to take advantage of all of those things. It's a very powerful uh, thing. And as you said, I think over time, uh, the Apple or the, the family sharing service has improved and grown stronger to give you more uh, than you could ever get before. And I think that helps cut back on some of the costs that someone would have uh, with a whole family of iOS devices. It makes it all the more valuable. Like, yeah, I definitely want to get fine. I want to get uh, my kids iOS devices or my family members iOS devices because we can all just share this plan up to uh, five people. Exactly. Yes. And I think that's the thing, you know, as well, when you when you look in the app store, uh, frequently you'll see something like supports family sharing. Um, and this pops up on a lot of different app store links. Uh, there, there is actually one in the uh, the document um, if you wanted to pop that up on the screen, Anthony. Um, but supports family sharing can occasionally be a little misleading because sometimes it's just the purchase of the app and the subscriptions are not actually included in that. So you'll probably either want to read through the description or when you go to sign up after you've done that, will offer you to share your subscription with uh, your, your family if that's something you can do. Now, not every subscription can be shared with a family. So that is potentially something to watch out for. And, you know, when in doubt, check the, check the docs. Hopefully the developer has got that information either in their uh, app description or on their website somewhere, which you can easily get to. But sharing all of these things does really, you know, increase value for money. So it's not just a case of you, you spend, for example, $20 a year on a draft subscription. You spend $20 a year on a draft subscription because you really want that. But then when a family member goes, hey, I'm looking for an app that's just really quick to take mm -hmm. text notes, then you can say, oh, download this. And hey, you've already got it for free. You don't need to pay for it again. I'm already paying for it. Um, and yes. that is, you know, where not only do you get to feel great because you make a recommendation, but you're not costing them any extra money uh, and you just kind of got everything lined up. And it, you know, really helps give you that feeling of, yes, 
I've succeeded. Yes, I, I feel the same way about the, the storage thing. You know, I have a family member who's going, I'm, you know, I don't have any more space to keep things on here. My my phone's about to run out. Oh, well, you know, turn on iCloud photo library. I know, but I don't have enough space in the cloud. Oh, okay. I forgot. I haven't added you to the family plan yet. Let me get you on there. And then suddenly they've got all this space to stretch out and use uh, to take advantage of, of the iCloud storage space that I have. Yeah, I just... It, I think it's a feel good thing for sure. And it's also just uh, a brilliant way to, to go about it. Let's kind of uh, break into some of the different features that are available because yes, we talked about iTunes and app store purchases uh, where you can share music, movies, books, TV shows, and apps that one person has purchased. Anybody who's part of the family is able to do that. Uh, and then, oh, and I, I, misquoted earlier, I said five people, it's up to six people in total uh, that you can have as part of a, a family. Um, Apple Music, of course, which lets you have like a full and complete Apple Music subscription iCloud storage, which depending on how much storage space you've purchased, uh, up to three terabytes, because you can do two terabytes plus a subscription, an extra subscription for one, I believe. Um, it might even be up to four terabytes, but certainly between three and four terabytes of total storage, uh, because iCloud Plus comes with, the, you can have it come with two terabytes of storage and then pay for an extra amount after that as an extra subscription. So plenty of storage space. Uh, location share is a very interesting one. Um, I am a person, yes, as, as James is saying in the chat, uh, up to four terabytes uh, because you can do two and then two is a separate uh, subscription. I am a person who's not keen on sharing my location in general. Um, it, you know, I, I've never really liked that feature outside of what we've talked about before in Apple Maps, the ability to uh, set an ETA, an estimated time of arrival in the Apple Maps app, and then someone can see kind of where you are along the route. But I've got a lot of friends and family who very happily with their friends or with their family members, they share their location at all times. Uh, some of them do it via Snapchat, but there's a built-in ability uh, to set up location sharing within the app itself. And so if you are part of a family, it makes it a little bit easier to do so, where not only can you share your location with all of your family members, but you can also set it up with uh, individual family members who can also share their location uh, with you. So then you're able to see uh, where that person happens to be. And, you know, you can keep track of, of the kids uh, as they're out and about, or, uh, you know, they can keep track of you makes and see, oh, you know, uh, dad's on his way home so we can uh, get ready for dinner or, or what have you. Uh, that's yeah. an easy thing to set up within uh, family sharing. Yeah, it is. But it's not just easy within family sharing. I feel I should mention from messages, if you tap on somebody's icon at the top, um, then you can go ahead and either just send your location right now, or you can then share your location. And it gives you options to share it for an hour until the end of the day or indefinitely. By default, if you share an Apple family with somebody, it will opt you in to sharing uh, indefinitely. It pops up a one-time question. You say yes or no, and then it shares your location with everybody in your family automatically. But you can turn that off. Equally, you can turn that on for people. I actually don't share an Apple family with my parents, but I do share my location with them and they share lo their location with me, which gives me a little advantage with the find my alerts that my parents are nearly at my place. So if they are showing up unexpected, at the very least, I, I get a, a push notification out of the blue before my parents turn up on my doorstep, which can be quite useful, I have to say. Um, <laughs> most of the time, I just use it for checking, uh, you know, are they actually leaving now, like they've said, or are they really still at home? Yeah, they're still at home. They're, they're going to be in another 20 minutes or whatever it is. Um, because, of course, that, that is one of the uh, downsides of family. Not, not always as punctual as you might like. Um, but yeah, it, there are, you know, good advantages to this as well as all of the other parts that you can share, um, you know, and it's not just the fact that you can share your purchases. You're sharing your payment method for this as well, which I feel is something that some people struggle with. And this is one of the reasons why I don't share family with my parents, because one person has to pay for everything. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean they have to pay for everything and you can't reimburse them. Of course you can, but then you end up keeping track of your purchases and so on and so forth. Um, but essentially the idea is there is one person who puts their card on the Apple account um, and then um, you, you share all of your purchases. By default, adults don't 
or and actually in general, I don't think you can even change this. Adults don't ask for purchases. So if an adult Correct. wants to buy something, if they're over the age of 18, bam, it, it just goes. Um, and whatever that is lands on the family uh, creator's uh, card, um, be that a debit card or credit card or other payment method. Now, there is a little way around this uh, to an extent, um, which I feel is worth sharing because this is what I used to do when I was living abroad. I wasn't really using my UK iTunes account all that much. Uh, what I did was I bought gift cards and I put them on my account because if you have a gift card balance on your account, then every time you buy something or something would use some of your purchase as, you know, for example, if you have an individual Apple Music subscription because you don't have a family one, um, then that comes off of your gift card balance. Um, and then leftovers, you know, if, if, for example, you have $5 left and you're spending $9.99, then $4.99 comes off of the card and the $5 comes out of the gift card purchase. And especially with the holiday season coming up, don't forget, folks, keep an eye out for those uh, gift cards with discounts because you can often buy them, you know, Apple iTunes gift cards at 10, even 20% off, um, which is a big saving if you're willing to plunk down that cash up front. Uh, James in the chat asked, is there a way to disable iCloud storage sharing with family members? And, and particularly, he's asking if you can disable it for one or some people, but share it with others. No, um, there's you can only basically turn it on or off for a specific family member. Um, so you... You, you or excuse me, you can only turn it off by removing them entirely so they don't get access to anything else or by stop by choosing to stop sharing with family. So it's kind of a it's it's one or the other. Either you have to remove that person from the family or you have to not be able to share uh, storage with anyone. There's no option to say, I want to share storage with this person. I want to share storage with this person, but I don't want to share storage with this person. It makes you choose uh, all of them. Now, one of the main reasons that people end up using uh, this this family thing is what we talked about earlier, the ask to buy feature. Um, I'll show you on mine, because I don't have any children accounts in my family, if I choose ask to buy, it will say, you need to set up an account for a child. Uh, tapping on create an account for a child lets you uh, create an account for a child, uh, at which point that child can log in. Well, you can log in on their device uh, with their child account. And then from that point on, you will get a request, a, a little notification that pops up that says, here's the thing that they want to purchase, yes or no. And then you can choose yes or no. And at that point, they will be able to or not be able to make that uh, purchase. So there's an easy way. And of course, you would want to show the child how to make it work because whenever you um, tap, whenever they tap on something in the app store, an alert will pop up to say, ask permission. A request to buy this app will be sent to your parent or guardian, and then you can cancel or you can choose ask. They would obviously tap ask, at which point the family member who's in charge there would get a request and uh, then they could say, yes, that two ninety nine dollars purchase you're allowed to make. Um, it's a very easy way to keep track of purchases and make sure that nobody's spending thousands of dollars on gems in some uh, pay to play app. Yeah, yeah. And I think that is something that you want to watch out for. You don't want to blindly be clicking OK on all of these things um, where, you know, you're getting these purchase requests. And unfortunately, they can be a little aggravating. Uh, and as a warning, uh, this is a question that actually came up from somebody a while ago. You can't let these come in through CarPlay um, so that you can approve them, which is a little bit of a shame um, because if it could just say, hi, uh, X person in your family has requested to spend two ninety nine on this thing. Would you like to accept, decline or reply later um, with the announcements that would that would be really helpful. Uh, but unfortunately, that that's not something that happens, um, which is a shame. But, um, you know, as well as limiting in app purchases, that's not all you can do with a child account. And the beauty of a child account um, that you create with Apple and specifically by creating it as a child account. Uh, first of all, a little word of warning, please input the date of birth correctly. If you input yes. the date of birth wrong, it cannot be changed. You have to delete the account, which can be a complete nightmare slash impossible to do at times. Um, but if you put, input the date of birth correctly, then it will automatically do things like safeguard App Store um, searches and downloads. So it won't let them download something that's rated for a higher age range. So if you put somebody in as, I don't know, 14, and they tried to download an app that's 18 plus, the app store is just not going to let them do it. It probably won't even let them see it. Um, at least it shouldn't come up in search. Um, and this 
you know, th this is one of the many features that Apple sets up. So to try and help you safeguard your children and they're not going to do it for you, um, but they are attempting to help you do this. Um, and you can also do things like prevent explicit content um, and you can set up content ratings for things. Um, you can restrict Game Center. Um, you can restrict web searches and so on. Now, I, I personally feel with some of these things, depending on the age of the child and the child involved, uh, there is definitely an education element that you need to include with this of not just saying like, no, I'm not going to let you do this you know, having that conversation yes. about why. Obviously with Absolutely. some kids that doesn't work, they're not going to listen or, you know, maybe maybe they can't listen um, or, or something. Um, but in general, um, you know, a, a lot of these content and privacy restrictions, for example, um, this will be just a, a question of, you know, I, I, I only want you to be on Facebook for two hours a week um, because quite frankly, Facebook is, is not a great app. Oh, great. You want to spend 14 hours a week on TikTok. I guess I probably should have put that in the screen time. Um, and that is the advantage of screen time um, on all of these devices, because if you set screen time up, um, it's not infallible. It, it certainly isn't perfect, but it will definitely help uh, keep an eye on things. And even if all you do is turn on screen time so that you've got an overview at the end of the week of how much you're using what application or how much a child is using what application, that can then help you, especially with the education aspect, hand in hand of saying, okay, well, look, hey, your grades are sliding, but you're spending 10 hours a day on TikTok. Um, maybe there's a correlation here, potentially. Maybe you're watching lots of math videos on, on TikTok. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that that's something that then, you know, your parenting skills come into play. And I'll, I'll let uh, all of you parents make the decisions for those. Yes, very well put. All right, we need to take a quick break before we come back with a little bit more about family sharing before we head into the rest of today's episode of iOS Today. I want to tell you that this episode of iOS Today is brought to you by BlockFi. Whether you're a crypto pro or a total beginner, like, like me, you can finally earn Bitcoin the easy way. With the world's first Bitcoin rewards credit card from BlockFi, you, yes you, can earn unlimited Bitcoin on every qualifying purchase you make. Introducing the BlockFi Rewards Visa Signature Card. Yes, it's a Visa Signature Card. It's the easiest way to get Bitcoin by just making everyday purchases. You can grow your Bitcoin portfolio when you buy your groceries, you pay your bills, you fill up at the gas station, or you pay your monthly subscription to your Apple One plan so that you can share everything with your family as part of family sharing. You can earn 1.5% back in Bitcoin on all qualifying purchases with no rewards limits. Plus, there's no annual fee and no foreign transaction fees, just Bitcoin earned on every single qualifying purchase. Now's the time to start or ramp up your Bitcoin portfolio. Why? Well, that's because Bitcoin saw a 230% annualized return in 2020. In fact, Bitcoin was the best performing asset of the last decade, outperforming the NASDAQ 100 by 10 times, according to Yahoo Finance. BlockFi is a leader in crypto and was named to Forbes FinTech 50 list in 2021. Plus, Block BlockFi is the easiest place to buy, to sell, and to earn crypto. There's no better time to sign up and start earning Bitcoin today. Right now, our listeners out there can get a bonus of $25 in crypto after you make your first purchase with the credit card. When you sign up at BlockFi.com slash iOS, that's a $25 bonus in crypto deposited right in your account after you make your first purchase. But you have to use our URL, BlockFi.com slash iOS, so start earning Bitcoin back on all your qualifying purchases today, BlockFi.com slash iOS. Terms and conditions, not all will be eligible. Geographic, regulatory, and underwriting restrictions apply. Fees and terms are subject to change. Additional terms of service at BlockFi.com. BlockFi is a financial technology company. Banking services provided by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. Our thanks to BlockFi for sponsoring this week's episode of iOS Today. All right. Uh, what do we have left? Oh, the uh, Apple Cash thing. This is a very new feature, a very cool new feature that's part of iOS um, that gives parents essentially the ability to create what amounts to a debit card for their kids that they can you could do an allowance on so i love this i love this idea that instead of uh giving out you know cash money as uh, parents used to do i we we didn't have an allowance growing up but i know some families did and instead of having that cash money going out uh you can just set an amount 
as part of the Apple Cash uh, app. And so what it does is it lets you send money to the uh, child account. It says family members who are under 18 and have an Apple ID account can use Apple Cash to send and receive money and use Apple Pay for purchases. So then you can create an account. Again, this is where you would need to create an account for a child. Um, or if the child already has an account, then you would set it up and, and you know uh, put it in here. And then it says, uh, th this is an example, the little screenshot there. It says, hi, mom, I need money for more ramen. And then uh, mom sends 20 bucks, which I'm surprised. I thought due to inflation that ramen costs more than $20 these days, but apparently not. Uh, mom says, again, you're going to turn into a noodle, LOL. Um, and then I assume this is like a, a college kid or something, a college kid interaction with the parent. And uh, so the child gets ramen noodle uh, money and is able to use that uh, via Apple Cash. I think this is great, especially for younger yeah. kids. Yeah, this is. And just to be clear, this is separate to the Apple Card family sharing, which is 13 plus. So you can actually send Apple Cash to, to kids younger than 13 plus, which means that they can use it for things. Um, um, and, you know, obviously they can send it um, to, to other people and so on as per the limitations and so on that you have set up. Um, but it is uh, not tied to the Apple Card family sharing. That is a separate thing, which obviously at least one of the adults in the family needs to have an Apple Card uh, account set up for that, um, where you can use that. Uh, there is one other thing that I would really like to mention, Micah, because you can actually set up an Apple Watch for a family member who doesn't have an iPhone um, to do it themselves. Now, this would be ideal in a use case for, say, for example, grandma who maybe doesn't even want a phone, but she likes her iPad um, and she's willing to wear an Apple Watch and you're, you're concerned about maybe grandma falling over and needing to be able to contact the emergency services and so on. And fall detection in the Apple Watch is great for that. I, I really, you know, recommend it. That's why I bought my grandmother an Apple Watch. Um, and so you can, um, as, as a family member, set up an Apple Watch for somebody else. Um, now, there are a little couple of little caveats to this. You need to have two-factor authentication set up on your own account, which you already should do. Um, and you'll need an Apple ID for that person. Um, and they need to then uh, end up um, in uh, your Apple family if they're not already. Um, it's not that you can set this up for somebody who then thereafter remains independent. They will be part of your Apple family with all of the bonuses that that entails. Um, but yeah, essentially you, you set it up. You need to be the organizer of the family or a parent or guardian to set that up. And then you can just go through and bam, you, you've got an Apple Watch that doesn't need an iPhone to function. Um, from reports I've heard from other people, these do work best with the cellular watches. Wi-Fi watches, uh, you know, they do connect to Wi-Fi, but uh, it's got some limitations to it. Obviously, if you're out of the house or just not in a great Wi-Fi area, or for example, you work somewhere where there's a commercial network, which requires a username and password to connect to the Wi-Fi network, that's not something the Apple Watch is capable of doing. Uh, so that for that, a cellular watch is going to be the best option for that. But uh, yeah, there's definitely some great advantages to Apple's family sharing. And I would recommend for anybody who's considering setting up a device for their child or something, go through with the with the child account inside of an Apple family. You don't have to add your partner to your Apple family if you don't want to. Um, you know, even though Apple's traditional model would say, yes, you should add your partner and your children to, to this. Um, you don't have to do that. You can't just set it up with a child and you approve all of their purchases, but it does give you a lot more oversight um, as to what's going on. And it automatically tries to set things up for safeguarding, which I think is a worthy thing to keep in mind when you're doing this. I think the one complaint I have is that um, with this setup, you have to be near the Apple Watch afterward in order to uh, further tool around with it. Um, because mm -hmm. I was at one point I was thinking I've got, you know, as I've upgraded Apple Watches, um, I've got some older ones that I purchased and was thinking about sending them to family members, uh, older family members who would have trouble getting them set up on their own. And so because of that, I was hoping that I would be able to set it up with my phone and send it to them. And then if they had issues, I would be able to use my phone to help them figure out what was wrong with it. Uh, but that doesn't work. Um, it, the phone, the watch needs to be near you. So the fact that I'm not close to, physically close, I mean, to my family members means that I can't really use this feature uh, all that well to give them an Apple Watch. Um, so that's kind of a bummer. But if your family member has an iPhone of their own, 
then they can set up the Apple Watch with their iPhone. This is, you know, more particularly for folks who don't have uh, an iPhone of their own and are just going to be using the Apple Watch. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And especially with the holiday season coming up, you know, you might be expecting a shiny new device for yourself or purchasing one for a family member. Keeping this stuff in mind is is well worth it for these things. And yes, if you're going to set up an Apple Watch for a family member, uh, try to make sure that it's somebody that you see regularly or if not, get somebody else who sees them more regularly or at the very least lives closer to them uh, to do that for you so that you don't have that uh, limitation where, Micah, you might have to go halfway across the country. I don't want to know how long that would take you to get there um, if somebody mm. had a problem with their Apple Watch and you couldn't fix it remotely. That would be terrible. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Um, Let's uh, move on to, unless you have anything else you want to say for this segment, I think we're ready to move on to the news. Yeah, we are ready to move on to the news. All right. Um, The first bit of news is an interesting story. And I have to say, I got it a bit wrong when I covered this story on MacBreak Weekly. Um, This story in its original form, uh, based on the reading that I had done from Notability itself and the changes that it had made and the initial backlash, led me to believe that Notability had offered several new features for subscribing. It was it's basically changing its its policy. It was going from an app where you download it, you, you pay to download it, and then it has some built-in stuff that you can buy to an app that is free to download completely with a subscription that gives you access to everything else. Uh, that is, that is the, the state of the app. However, folks who had purchased the app and the stuff inside that they wanted... Um, they were given a notification, myself included, that said, hey, here is uh, everything that you've purchased and, and you know all of that kind of stuff. You will have access to this for a year. After that year, everything is going subscription for you. you know, everybody else who's new will subscribe to get access to the stuff. But after that year, basically you got a year free of the subscription. So for folks who had purchased all of these things, at the end of that year, they were going to have to start paying for the things that they had already bought. My misunderstanding and the part that I got wrong was I didn't realize that what was coming afterward was stuff that I had already purchased. So mm-hmm. that is, that, that's the thing here is that Notability was essentially taking away from users stuff that they had already purchased after one year of subscription. And there was backlash, um, reasonably so. In its original form, um, the way that I understood it was backlash that tends to happen uh, when an app goes kind of free to play, essentially, where it starts offering a subscription service uh, instead of just being a free app with a one-time purchase to to buy the stuff. And I am always a thousand percent for developers being able to make sustainable income off of the apps that they make. Apps are hard. Uh, Keeping up with apps is hard. Making money in apps is very hard. And so developers should be able to make money uh, in the app store. Unfortunately, um, this was not exactly that situation. This was a situation where they were trying to take away what was given to folks who had paid for it. So Mm -hmm. while I celebrate the future of notability and the sustainable method of notability, which is a subscription service, I do join in the protest of the way that they had set things up for folks who did, who had already purchased things, who did not have a subscription enough. There was enough of a backlash that notability updated and said, Hey, you're right. We were wrong about this. We should not have uh, taken away things from people who already had a subscription. Uh, so Notability users who had already paid will continue to have access to those features uh, despite the fact that the the app is going to a subscription service. I think, yeah. I'm curious, Rosemary, to hear your take on this. I think that were it handled better people would have been less upset because many people, I feel, many people who do buy apps and who do pay subscriptions for apps are the people 
who do really like for apps and the developers who make them to like to actually support those people. And so yeah. if you do things in a genuine way and you are honest about it and you're clear about it and you are you, you have integrity about it, I think that the people who, you know, came out in in being upset would not have been as bothered. Uh, but right. it's because of the way that it was set up that that it, it was yeah. an issue. Yeah, because whenever a service goes from one-time purchase to subscription, there is going to be backlash. We know this. Um, and, you know, to some extent, I, I'm there looking at it every single time. Another app goes subscription going, dang it, that that's, you know, more money than I'm paying monthly or annually for this, which previously I didn't need to pay. But I am fully in favor of actually paying developers for the work they do because every time Apple ships an update, it breaks something. Even if it doesn't break something for their app, it breaks something for another app, which they could be working on. Um, but haven't yet released or, you know, just they need to learn about these things or just be aware of the, the, the things that are broken or take advantage of the new features. You know, simply existing in the app store is not free in and of itself, let alone existing and continuing to work. So I am in favor of this, but yeah, it, it is very much how they frame the message. Um, you know, what are they doing? What have they done for the people who were previously subscribing uh, or who have previously paid um, and therefore are going to get it? Um, I, 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 they should. Um, An app store regulations or guidelines say that um, if you have Pay, had a pay upfront app and you change it to free with a subscription model, you cannot take features away from people who've already paid for them. That's not something that you can do. So Apple actually say this. Um, and I think that the slightly cynical part of me want, uh, thinks that maybe that had a play in what Ginger Labs did here, Ginger Labs being the creator behind Notability, um, because they know that if, if um, you know, people turn around and say to Apple, um, did you know they're taking away all the features that everybody who previously bought the app um, pay, you know, has already paid for it? Then Apple will almost certainly step in and go, you can't do that. That's not okay. Um, I know when Airmail made a similar misstep um, that, um, you know, when people pointed that out, they went, ah, yes, okay. And the, and they fixed that, which is a good thing. Um, and so app developers need to be aware of this. But yeah, I think it's just around the framing of the message at the end of the day, you know, saying, hey, we've got a bunch of new features. Those are premium only. You know, you're going to need to subscribe, but you've not lost anything that you already mm -hmm. had um, is, is the important part. And making it very clear that, you know, first of all, the people that already paid, they, they, probably need to remind them that they appreciate them because that's where the money came from to do the work that they're currently releasing now. Very well put. And I also think that um, the fact that, uh, oh, I, I like what Notability is trying to do. They want to be able to offer this app for free to the education market. Yes. And so that, you know, they need the funding to be able to do that. And that's what the subscription service is going to do in part is help them uh, make this free for education. And so again, that's where I say like the folks who are happy to pay this would be happy to help support that. <laughs> so let's make it so that, that, you know, everything's clear. And yes, the folks who already paid for it should not have to repay for it. And in fact, it's against the rules to do so. So I'm not surprised uh, that that happened. All right, uh, let's move on. I wanted to talk about the, uh, there was, I just got a, an email, I think last night, letting me know about a pretty cool new Kickstarter project. Uh, it's called the iOS app icon book. Um, the book itself will be about 70 bucks if you want to back the Kickstarter. Uh, but it is a book filled with app icons and kind of the story of the app icons in some cases, uh, as well as sort of iterations on the design. Uh, a really neat book that has loads of different apps that you'll be familiar with, uh, some that may be new to you, and uh, offers, I think, it's mostly a, a coffee table book inspiration um, to, to look through. But uh, what is a more appropriate gift for someone uh, who loves apps than this iOS app icon book? I think this is a really cool project idea. Uh, so I just had to, to throw this in there after I got that email. I thought, oh, wow, that's so fun. And it kind of just shows, too, how apps have changed over time, how the app icons have changed over time, what they look like now versus uh, when iOS first launched and uh, the skeuomorphic design changing to something mm -hmm. more flat and then coming yep. back a little bit towards textures and colors. And uh, there are just some brilliant 
uh, designs in there, as well as some brilliant stories in this book. So pretty cool. Yeah, and I think that's something that maybe people don't necessarily realize. Behind every app icon, there is uh, at the very least a little bit of a story of what what makes somebody think that this icon relates to this 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 name that we've got through the app and therefore the functionality. You know, for example, most medication trackers have got a pill on the icon somewhere or something like that because that's what you think of when you think of medication usually. Um, and so finding out these stories behind them and and how you know people came up with this idea and some of the design process as well. I May end up with a copy of this, um, Micah, just because it, it looks fascinating. And I have to say, I'm a sucker for for a, a, a good book. And they've even got modern things in here, like the Apollo app, which has got loads of different icons and frequently sourced from the community. Um, and I love, you know, the different approaches that developers have taken over the years to, you know, add more icons to their apps as that's become a feature and how things have changed. So I'm yep. looking forward to this. Me too. Me as well. All right. Uh, then we wanted to mention a, this is a neat little tool, I guess, a, a neat little accessory for the Apple Watch uh, from 12 South called the Action Band. And mm -hmm. uh, right now there's a sale on said Action Band. It's great for folks who are working on their fitness. Uh, yeah. It's a Terry yeah, it's a Terry Cotton workout band that you can strap to your arm and uh, be able to keep track of your fitness, which this is great because if there is one thing uh, I know is that using the Apple Watch while f fitnessing, uh, things do get sweaty and uh, it, it often is kind of this you know, you're wondering if the watch is properly tracking your heart rate uh, between you and um, the the coolant <laughs> that exists between the surface of your skin and the watch itself. So, yeah. 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 Now, I know that I've used various different things over the over the years, like sport loops and things like that. Um, the new Velcro sport loop that does better, but you end up having to wash it out. Uh, pro tip for people who are looking uh, to try and clean them. You can put them in like a, a, a mesh bag in your laundry on a gentle cycle. I usually just hand wash them with hand soap, though, um, to, to get them clean. But they do get sweaty. The solo loops, um, you know, they tend to get slippery and feel on your skin. So I think I'm going to give this a try. And it comes with a matching ish one for the other wrist as well, which is just a plain uh, cuff, uh, which obviously doesn't have an Apple Watch uh, spot for it um, so that you don't feel quite so lopsided. Uh, but if you're looking for a gift for somebody for the holidays and you know that they're getting into fitness, um, then uh, this this could be a good one or maybe a bad one uh, if they take it the wrong way um, and think that you're inclined <laughs> that they should be working out a lot. Right. But uh, I know right. I would be thrilled to receive this um, and it's actually going on my Christmas Christmas list. So uh, fingers crossed somebody in my family uh, grabs that one for me. And last but not least is a little story about WhatsApp, um, which now finally, finally uh, supports multi-device compatibility. However, like another app we know, Instagram by Meta, it does not have an iPad app. And we continue to say, uh, why don't you have an iPad app? Oh, I know. It's so frustrating. I have to say the vast majority of my friends over the last year or so um, have migrated to using Telegram. Um, and Telegram is fabulous because it does not need your phone to be online for anything to work. And they have an iPad app as well. And it just works everywhere on all the devices all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to WhatsApp actually getting an iPad app. Apparently Mark Zuckerberg has promised us. However, considering the number of things that Mark Zuckerberg has promised us and perhaps not done such a great job of delivering, then perhaps we we don't necessarily want it if it is one of those. But I'll cross my fingers and hope that for those few friends who are still holding out on WhatsApp that I get an iPad app um, because multi-device compatibility has significantly improved my WhatsApp experience over the last couple of months. All right, folks, we are going to take another quick break before we come back with a little bit of, um, ex of an accessory review. I'm pretty excited about this, uh, but we'll take a quick break first. So I can tell you about Audible, who are bringing you this episode of iOS today. I love Audible. I love Audible. I know I talk about it all the time, but I love Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment. Right now, you can get excited for the holiday season and it's going to be more special than the last. It's finally time to gather together and exchange thoughtful gifts with the people you care about. In the midst of all the holiday excitement, think about giving yourself the gift 
of an Audible membership. Now is the absolute best time to do it because you get a special offer of 46% off your first four months. With Audible, you can listen to more of whatever you're into because Audible has it all. An unbeatable selection of audiobooks, tons of binge-worthy podcasts and exclusive originals, and it's all available to download or stream. Here's what you get. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month, like the latest bestseller or hottest new release, and it's yours to keep forever. But here's the best part. You also get full access to Audible's streaming library, the Plus Catalog. You can discover your next podcast obsession, check the audiobook off your bucket list, or get lost in a world of original content from celebrity creators, best-selling authors, and leading experts, the kind of stuff you can't hear anywhere else and stream all you want as much as you want. To use your Audible membership, you'll need to download the Audible app. The Audible app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. I love Audible. I My Audible library is gigantic because I pretty much am always listening to an audiobook uh, when I you know have downtime, when my hands don't need to be focused on a specific task. There tends to be an audiobook hanging around, uh, playing its way through. Right now, I'm uh, listening to a bit of a guilty pleasure uh, because this series of audiobooks is, uh, I, I like, I really like fantasy um, titles. And I'm waiting for a couple of my favorite fantasy series to come out with the latest title. And so in the meantime, I'm listening to uh, a series called Schooled in Magic, which is this story about a young woman who is taken from the world, uh, our world, to another world. And it realizes she has magic and needs to go to school to learn how to use this magic and defend herself um, against the bad group that brought her to the world and uh, unfortunately lots of other people as well as uh, she starts to introduce things from the earth to uh, this new world that she's she's living in. It's a really interesting series, and I've just been been gobbling up uh, title after title uh, in my spare time while I'm waiting, as I said, for the titles uh, from the series that I, I listen to regularly uh, to come through. So Audible is a great place um, to just find stuff you can listen to and zone out on or zone in on uh, if you choose there. No matter where you're going or what you're doing this holiday season, you'll always have just the right thing to listen to at your fingertips. It's perfect for commuting. It's perfect for being at the gym, long road trips, or just cozying up by a fire. Right now, for a limited time, you can save 46% on your first four months of Audible. That's only $7.95 a month. Give yourself the gift of listening. For more, go to audible.com slash iOS today or if you're listening on the go, text IOS today to 500 500. That's A U D I B L E dot com slash IOS today, or text IOS today to 500 500 to start your free trial today. Have I mentioned I love Audible? Because I do. I'm listening to it all the time. Thank you, Audible, for sponsoring this week's episode of IOS today. Now, let's show off some accessories for your iPhone. Yeah, so we mentioned these a little while ago, actually, on the show, um, and that is the Anchor MagGo stuff. Um, and I went ahead because I was in the market to see whether or not um, I could perhaps uh, give my dad a battery pack for his phone that he might actually finally use. Um, and also, my mom has been asking for something to help her hold her phone. So I went ahead and I picked up their new MagGo battery and the ring grip as well. Um, and I know that quite a few people are interested in battery packs because there is the Apple MagSafe battery pack, but that's $99. Um, it's not got the largest of capacities, is one way you could put it. Um, and it's still relatively bulky for the size of the thing. Um, and I've, I've shown off the, the other previous Anchor magnetic battery. And these are almost the same tech, um, so there's not a huge difference. But uh, if you do compare them, there is a little bit of a size difference here, um, but it's not that much bigger. And this has 
three times the capacity pretty much. Um, it is a significantly larger on the internals battery than the MagSafe. And it also comes, Micah, with this amazing feature. Aside from the fact that it comes in green, which I know is your favorite color, <laughs> it comes with a stand. So what you can do, and I'm just going to unplug my phone for this. I'm going to have to plug that back in for my app cap. You can actually put it on your phone. And then uh, this is very difficult to demo because I don't happen to have a table handy. So my hand has to stay super still. Um, but you can stand your phone up and it's really wow. solid. I'm really impressed. Like this is not going anywhere. But equally, when you put it back in, it, it's, you know, that flap isn't coming out, not by default. It's just got this tiny little uh, sort of uh, place where you can slide in your fingernail at the top and then you can pull it out. Um, and then there's, it's a little grippy inside of here where the, uh, the there's a, a space, very difficult to see on camera with the lighting and everything, uh, but that's where the, uh, the little part just goes and then it just magnetizes in place. And this has been really good. I gave it a pretty good test at the weekend. I didn't charge my phone uh, overnight as I usually do and then made my phone use the battery throughout the day. It was not annoying me to use it um, and it charged my phone back up. So, you know, especially if you're in the market for a battery pack and you would like something that has a functionality where you can use it as a stand, this is great. And it charges with USB-C, um, which can be uh, quite nice if you are somebody who tries to minimize the number of cables you travel with. I know USB-C is my favorite for travel because it charges almost all of my devices nowadays, though yes. not everything, sadly, um, but close to. I, so, yeah, yeah, this is such a brilliant uh, device with that, you know, that you can use it as a travel charger there with the USB-C at the bottom, um, that it has the MagSafe, which means that not only can you have the phone in portrait mode uh, connected there with, uh, with it propped up, but you could also put the phone in landscape mode mm -hmm. and have it sitting yep. there. So if you wanted to watch something on your phone or do a, a video call or something like that, it's very easy to do. Uh, it's just, it's such a smart idea. It's just such a smart idea that it's one of those things where you look at it and you're almost a little frustrated, like, oh, that's so brilliant. That's such a good idea. <laughs> Who came up with that? Um, yes. And then you get happy whenever you get one and you get to just have it, you know, there uh, charging your device and in uh, other cases kind of holding your device up whenever you are uh, setting it. it. It's what's great about it, too, is you get this all in one um charger where it can be that kind of desk stand for you when you when you mm -hmm. want it or it can be as you pointed out kind of a mobile charger or some other thing so yeah i think it's uh, a pretty smart pretty smart design um from anchor there now did you say the price i, I don't recall uh, no, I didn't. It's fifty nine ninety nine. But what I would definitely say with all Anchor products and indeed anything that we've mentioned on the show recently, unless it's specifically on sale right now, I would have a look. Black Friday is coming. Keep an eye out for those Black Friday deals. Anchor stuff nearly always goes on sale pretty well for Black Friday. So take advantage of that and uh, make sure that you uh, don't forget that you can uh, chuck things in your Amazon basket and use something like Camel, Camel, Camel to get yourself the best deal of the lot. Uh, one feature I do want to mention, just because um, I'm, I'm sure some people will not know, there's a button on the bottom where you get a little LED indicator of how much battery is remaining. And of course, because this is a Qi charger, you can pop your AirPods on there and it's difficult to see, but they lit up. Bam, they're charging. Uh, and so you can charge your AirPods on this as well. Though not while it's standing up. That that would be very difficult to do. Um, <laughs> but it is, you know, that is a feature that you can use um, with that, which is, you know, nice. If you are going to take a, a, case, a charger with you somewhere, you would like it to be able to charge all of your devices without doing, you know, without carrying thousands of cables. Of course, you can plug a USB-C to lightning into the battery and then use that to charge your AirPods as well. But if your AirPods came with a wireless charging case, um, which... AirPods generally do nowadays, um, unless you buy the absolute bottom ones. And, you know, that is uh, a nice feature that, you know, can make you get the best out of your iPhone as well as your other accessories. Nice. And then you had one other to show us. Yeah. So I've mentioned my MagSafe pop socket on the show before and people were, have been interested. I've had lots of tweets from people telling me that they've ended up grabbing one of these and it's changed their phone um, experience and just made it easier to hold their phone. Anchor have got something similar with this ring grip. Um, so I'll just pop this off my phone. Um, if you've got your phone in a MagSafe case, by the way, it pops off much more difficultly, um, especially if you've got a silicone one, because this ring 
round here around the base is actually made of silicon. Um, and then inside of it, there's just this, this metal ring that folds out on a hinge. That's upside down. The anchor logo is the wrong way around. Um, and then, you know, the, that, you know, can just use that to hold your phone. Or if you put it on your phone uh, the right way around, depending on what it is you're trying to do, then you can use it to just sort of prop your phone off the table a little bit. Uh, it is not really designed for that, um, but it it certainly can work. Though, of course, don't forget, this is rounded, so it's going to wobble from side to side. Um, but you can, you know, potentially just use it to help prop your phone up to take a photo or something. It's not going to stay like that for long. If, you, if you're pressing on your phone, it is going to go back. This, this ring moves relatively quickly um, or easily, I should say. But it is a nice option and it's only $16, $15.99. Um, so for people who are looking for something like that, then, you know, keep an eye out if it goes on sale. The one thing I'll say is if you're using it on a bare iPhone, um, like I've got here, I find it comes off incredibly easily. Like I, I'm, I'm hardly oh, doing wow, anything yeah. to just pull that off. Um, but if you use a MagSafe case or I have uh, the Moft case here, um, which has got extra magnets in to make things extra secure. Um, and that's, that's what they say anyway. I'm giving it a try. Um, then I'm finding that this, it's actually pretty difficult to get off. So, um, <laughs> you know, make sure you're using an appropriate case with this. Uh, if you are not using a MagSafe case, MagSafe accessories are obviously not going to work very well for you. Um, but if you are looking for something like a battery or um, a, a thing that sticks on the back of your phone, then uh, yes, you make sure you've got a case that supports that because otherwise you're going to find it falls on the floor an awful lot more easily than you might wish. Um, and uh, yes, I'm I'm probably going to stick with my pop socket. I like it. My mom was after something a little more discreet um, and I, I let her use this for a couple of hours at the weekend and then said, I need to take it away to talk about it on iOS today. And she was unhappy with me. So I will have to go and return this later um, because I think my mom wants it back. But uh, yes, it is, you know, it, it's good. It works nicely with the MagSafe case. I would definitely recommend a MagSafe case for this particular mag ring, but uh, if you're looking for something perhaps a little less uh, large than the MagSafe pop socket um, and perhaps in slightly more discreet colors, um, then uh, the the MagGo ring from Anchor is uh, definitely a worthy option. They have some other charging products in the MagGo range as well. I should point out it's MagGo, not MagSafe. It interacts with the MagSafe feature on your phone, but it isn't MagSafe itself. So you don't get that feature where, for example, if I connect um, the MagSafe battery to my phone, it should uh, pop up and show that MagSafe um, connection there. Um, it won't do that if um, you are using a MagGo product because it's a combination of magnets and Qi charging rather than MagSafe, which is also magnets and Qi charging, but to a specific standard, which is something uh, that can be a bit tricky to wrap your head around. Thank you, Apple and Anchor, for making this wonderfully clear and easy for everybody to understand. Um, but uh, yes, it's something to remember when you're looking at these things. It is difficult, um, and Apple's sort of requirements. There were there have been a few pieces kind of talking about um, the state of MagSafe itself versus some of the third party magnetic chargers and what it takes to get MagSafe uh, compatibility, and how some companies kind of had an early uh, heads up there. Uh, Belkin, for example, worked uh, more directly with Apple in order to have those products ready to go uh, on day one or close to day one, whereas some others uh, needed to wait a little bit longer. So there still aren't a whole lot of true MagSafe uh, devices out there. Uh, instead, there are ones that work with the MagSafe uh MagSafe magnets on the phone or the case, but aren't actual MagSafe products. So it gets a little messy right now. And I hope that we'll get that cleared up within the next uh, iteration of the iPhone. All right, yes. folks, I think I hear the sound. It's time for Shortcuts Corner. Bum, 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 bum. Hello and welcome to Shortcuts Corner, the part of the show where you write in with your shortcuts requests and the shortcuts expert Rosemary Orchard provides your shortcuts answers. Uh, the first bit of Shortcuts Corner comes from Oliver, who is following up on a shortcut about alarms. Oliver writes in all caps, wow, 
and then not in all caps. I had no doubt you'd come through, but you exceeded my wildest expectations. Your solution worked perfectly with a couple tiny modifications, and I learned a few things in the process. I don't think I'd ever have come up with the idea of using the modulus on my own. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for taking my question. Much love, Oliver. As we said before, I love it whenever folks write in, uh, and I think I may have mispronounced that word, but anyway, um, I love it when folks write in uh, to let us know that the shortcut worked. And in this case, it sounds like not only did it work, but uh, also you get a chance to learn some things. And that's why, Rosemary, I love these kinds of feedback segments because even if you aren't the direct question asker, you may be inspired to try something of your own, or you may uh, decide that what that person is asking is something that you want to do too. And then you tool with it a little bit to make it just how you need it. And it works out for you. Um, what was Oliver's was this the uh, person who needed help with work alarms? I don't recall. Yeah, yeah. The, he needed the, okay. the help with work alarms where he wanted an alarm to go off every hour um, while he was at work. And then it, also every three hours, he needed another alarm to remind him to fill out the log files. And that's where the modulus came in to calculate the every three hours. Because, of course, that's much easier than saying if the time is uh, two or if the time is five or the time, you know, that's very difficult to set up in shortcuts. You end up nesting all of those steps all the way down. And that's just not great, to be honest. Um, I'm, I'm not super pleased with that as a solution for things. And I was really pleased when I hit upon the idea of modulus. So I'm glad that Oliver liked it as well. And most importantly, that it worked for him, because that is, of course, the feedback that I want to hear from people. Not only that, you know, they, they like the solution, that's fine, but I want to hear that it worked for people. Um, and that that that's what makes me happy, Micah, in Shortcuts Corner. Yes, me too. All right, here comes a Shortcuts Corner request from Kenny. Kenny writes in to say, I love the show and appreciate all the work you put into it. I am new to Shortcuts and Automation, inspired by your show, all, and I am running into an issue with my garage door. I have the Chamberlain MyQ sensors that let me open and close them from my phone and watch, as well as telling me their state. I want to set up time-based notifications to warn me when either door is left open after 8 p.m. The MyQ app will tell me if the door opens or closes, but not if it is left open. I set up HomeBridge. Ah, oh, there we go, Kenny. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I set up HomeBridge on my NAS, my network attached storage, and was able to bring the doors into the iOS Home app as accessories. That works great. But I am stuck with figuring out the automated notification. I even tried the PushCut app to set this up, but the MyQ sensors don't show up as sensors to be added. I appreciate any help. Thanks, Kenny. Kenny, I love that you went ahead and got HomeBridge set up. That is, I have the MyQ door opener as well. I access it through the uh, through HomeBridge on a Raspberry Pi I have set up on my network uh, to be able to control it within the Home app. And I know where Rosemary is going with this, and I'm very excited to hear about Rosemary's solution. Well, I actually have a couple of solutions and also just a, a question because I did actually have some back and forth with Kenny, but I forgot to ask the important question. How do you define left open? Because that is, of course, the mm. difficulty here. What is left open? If you just open the garage door and you're in the garage working, um, doing some stuff, um, you know, say, for example, it's it's the summer season where you are and you're doing things and it's light outside. So you leave the door open. Well, you haven't left it open. You're actually working in there. Um, but for the purposes of this, I decided that left open is it's been open for 10 minutes and nobody's closed it because 10 minutes is a good period of time for a couple of reasons. And one of them is that shortcuts can't wait for 10 minutes. And you're probably going, Rose, why are you telling us something that shortcuts can't do? Well, there, there are limitations to shortcuts. There are quite a few things that shortcuts can't do. Waiting for 10 minutes inside of a shortcut action is not something you can do. I know people have tried to work around this before by using a repeat and a wait inside of the repeat. And so say, for example, if their wait is 60 seconds, they would repeat that 10 times you still end up with the same problem pretty much in that at some point it times out and it just doesn't run. And that's where things get a little bit difficult because I think what the right solution here for Kenny is a combination of things. So he mentioned Homebridge and he mentioned Pushcut and I think there's a piece of the puzzle missing and that is Homebridge dummy sensors. So if you think of uh, HomeKit um, as all of these plugs and things that you've got set up in your home, so you've got smart plugs. So say, for example, I've got a light up here that's my studio lights that's connected to a smart plug so that when I go to bed, if I've been 
podcasting, they get they get turned off, um, which is really good because otherwise that light is actually bright enough that it leaks all the way through the hallway into everywhere else. Well, that's a real plug, a real switch. Um, but Homebridge dummy sensors will let me do something similar without actually having a device connected to it. So I am just going to pop up on my iPhone here to show people a couple of examples. Um, and apologies for some things not responding. I'm having an issue with uh, one of my hubs right now. It's losing power. I think I need to replace the USB cable. Um, but if we look at the option here in the top left, battery cup cleaned, this is my robot vacuum. When my robot vacuum is cleaned, it turns this switch on. And then at midnight every night, something turns it off. Um, and that's one kind of dummy switch where something, you know, it's not an actual device. Nothing is actually being turned on or turned off by this. It's a status. Um, and I use this for lots of different things. But there's another kind of dummy switch. In fact, there's there's a couple of other kinds. There's one that will just toggle on and then immediately back off again. And that's designed to let you trigger something that maybe you can't do otherwise in HomeKit. Um, but the one that you're looking for, Kenny, is the timed dummy switches where you, they turn on automatically and then they will turn off after a period of time. Because what you can do then is you can calculate 10 minutes and seconds. Uh, so, you know, that's 10 times 60. Um, and then you can put that in, or it might need to be milliseconds. I've got a link in the show notes for you for, for HomeBridge dummy. And then when the HomeBridge dummy switch turns off, okay, so you're Opening your garage door is going to turn the dummy switch on. That's what you want. Um, and closing the garage door probably needs to turn it off as well, but that's not so important. What you want to do is you want to create an automation for when your dummy switch turns off. And you can do this from the home app or from shortcuts. Um, and uh, I, I'm i going to go ahead. Oops, uh, I've turned that on. I didn't need to do that. I actually haven't run my uh, robot vacuum today. So I need to do that before I uh, go to bed tonight. You can just add an automation here. Um, and then you can say when an accessory is controlled, um, and this is what you're using. Okay, you're using the accessories controlled. So when for when your garage door opens, it turns the switch on, and then after ten minutes, it's going to turn itself back off. Um, and then you need to just uh, pick one of your dummy switches. So where did uh, my logic go? There it is. That's my switch. So when it turns off. And now we get to the interesting part because you don't want to do any of your scenes or control anything like this. No, no, no. Convert it to a shortcut. Get rid of your setting your scenes. And that's where I would probably go ahead and call push cut and just have push cut do some logic here. Because if push cut is the one doing the logic, then that's going to be much easier for you to handle. And then inside of the push cut shortcut, what you'll do is is you'll you'll check things, but we need to call push cut somehow. And there's an action for this. You 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 might be looking for a shortcuts action. That's not what you want. You want get contents of URL, and then in the push cut app, um, which uh, I can't type today, but inside of the push cut app, um, then you can copy the URL to one of your shortcuts. Um, so if I, for example, copied uh, this URL. Um, then that is uh, something that I can just go ahead and paste in here. Um, it's got a key in it, so I'm not going to do that because um, otherwise everyone's going to see my key and I'm going to have to reset it and let's go break all the things. But that, no worries. getting the contents of the URL is what's going to trigger push cut to run. And that can then run your shortcut. Um, and I say um, to do this because you you probably want to do that logic in on in, on a phone that's sitting there always running. But if, Kenny, you don't have an iPhone or an iPad or an iPod Touch hanging around, it's just going to sit there running shortcuts all day because your name isn't Rosemary Orchard. That's okay. I'm, I'm going to let that slide and I'm going to show you how to do all of it here. Because if you have push cut to send you the notification, which is different to running a shortcut on a server, then you can do that. So what you can just do is you can do if... Um, we need to get the status of something. This is why we needed to uh, delete that action first because the first action wanted to control things. We don't want to do that. So we want to get the status. And I have a door sensor. Um, and so what I can do instead of getting the door sensor name, I can get the state. Okay, so this is my bedroom door sensor. And then I can say if, um, and I would recommend, uh, I, I skipped past it, so I'm going to cancel uh, that and oh, do it again. Um, so inside of an if action, you can actually say, select a HomeKit accessory, uh, pick something, I'll pick my blinds, and then say, if the current position is this. I have found this to be somewhat flaky in that it works most of the time, but every so often things will just randomly not work. And you, you don't necessarily want 
that to be the case because if something's not working and you don't get a notification that your garage door is open, that that's not good. You really don't want that. So that's where my get state action comes in. Um, and uh, I'm not quite sure what is going on here with uh, shortcuts. There we go. Get state. Um, and I'll just pop that in at the top. Um, so get the state of my accessory. So I'll scroll back down and find wherever it's gone. My... I stick all of these uh, extra switches, by the way, in a separate room called Logic. Um, and so um, you can, uh, that's the power state of my, my, my Logic switch. I should have gone with my door. There we go. Get my door sensor, contact state, because bearing in mind, it doesn't matter that this is my bedroom door and you've got a garage door. And at the end of the day, it's closed or it's open. That's, that's the part that we need. And that's what I've done some testing on. Um, and so if, um, and then we change this, we select a magic variable, tap and hold it to select your magic variable. Um, and then if it has any value, then we know here inside of our if part, that means that it's closed. And so it's only with the otherwise. And we're going to get use get contents of URL again. But this time we just need to uh, get the contents of a notification URL. So I am going to get my, uh, my home automation URL. This is one that I uh, don't need to worry about here. I'll just clear this. And then I can paste it. Now, this is something you should probably have set up in advance so that you know that when you get that notification, it'll say something actually useful. You can give this a name. Um, I will go with delete this after the show because otherwise I will have strange things happening all <laughs> over the place and I won't know why. Um, and then uh, this is the part where, um, of course, it uh, gets uh, to be really fun. This turns on cool, nothing happens, it turns off. And then uh, if it weren't for um, my focus mode, I would get a notification to tell me that um, the door is still open um, and therefore that I probably need to go and close it. So that is what I would do there. This is not perfect. It is very difficult to check if the status of something continually stays open. Um, and that is something where I think HomeKit itself really needs to step up to the plate. Uh, mm -hmm. You can do things like you can have another device. And this is what I used to do. I used to use Pushcut for this. Whenever the door opened, it would then poll. Um, every 30 seconds, it would schedule itself to run every 30 seconds or every minute or something and check if something was still open. Um, and it would count every single time it went through that and it would pass that information through and it knew when it got to five um, that the door was left open because my definition for the door left open was five minutes. But that requires you to have another device that's on that's constantly running a shortcut or multiple shortcuts depending on your, your use case um, to do all of these things. And that gets extra complicated here. Now, shortcuts is incredibly powerful, but if we can keep this with just the tools that you've already got, I think that's going to be the best solution for you, Kenny. So fingers crossed this works. Uh, sorry, it's taken a while to get you. I've had to do quite a bit of testing. Um, and I even set up a fake home with a fake garage door sensor at one point to see if there was something that I was missing that I didn't have. Um, and I was very sad to find out that my fake garage door sensor had no more properties than just a, a, a standard door sensor, other than the ability to tell it to open and close my garage door, which didn't really exist, um, which was a shame. It would have been nice if it had come with a free garage. That, um, But uh, there we go. Fingers crossed this will solve your problem or at least help you, Kenny. The other thing, of course, I should mention that you can do, and this is easy to do in the Shortcuts app, and perhaps is uh, worth doing, um, and so I'm, I'm going to say it as well, um, is create a personal automation to just run at a certain time of day. Um, I'm going to set this to a couple of minutes in the future. Um, and then you're going to repeat um, a little bit of what we just have, which is the get state. Um, and then all of these, by the way, there are various different, mostly fake houses. Um, so you want to get the state of something. Um, and then I will hopefully select my bedroom door again and get the contact state. And then this is where you don't need push cut because what you're just going to do is you're just going to check whether or not um, this uh, has any value. And if it does, that's um, uh, where we want to send a notification because this is a shortcut running on your device. It will just tell you. And this is really useful for, for example, something that you could run every night at a specific time or better still, um, what I would recommend is actually tying this to something like putting your phone on charge or your phone switching into the sleep status mode. Um, because if you create this as a shortcut, you can actually run it loads of places. Um, and then you can just send a notification that says the door is still open. Um, and then 
uh, that will just check at a very specific time to see if the door is open and tell you. Um, and of course, if somebody's just come home and they're still parking in the garage and the door is open, that, you know, it's not perfect. But if, uh, yeah, they, if this is uh, perhaps just a better, easier, simpler solution for you, then go ahead and give that a go um, because you can just check at a certain time of day when your phone goes into your sleep status mode or, um, you know, when you put your phone on charge. Um, what you can also do, um, which I should have said and I forgot, I'm sorry, um, is um, uh, as well as the state, what you can do is you can also, I've shown this trick off before, you can get network details. Um, and if you get your network details, um, then you can get the name of your IP address uh, sorry, the name of your Wi-Fi address. And then you can put this whole thing inside of another if and say, if the network details name is, um, and then I'm going to put in the name of my network here, which is the promised, oops, which I can't spell, uh, LAN, because I am a geek and who <laughs> doesn't like geeky network names? Um, lab? No, LAN, all caps, thank you. Um, I'll just delete my otherwise and then I just need to pop all of these actions inside of here. And then it's only going to check when I'm at home. Um, and so if I'm not at home, for example, I'm on holiday, the shortcut will run, but nothing will happen. Like even if the garage door is open, nothing's going to happen because hopefully somebody else is dealing with that because I'm not at home. So uh, yeah, fingers crossed. There's a couple of different solutions there for you, Kenny. Hope one of them works. Uh, and I would love to hear it if, it if it does or if it doesn't, but you find another solution, please tell me too. Yes. And Kenny, I'd like to show you how you can do this just in the MyQ app. Uh, I understand why you may have thought that the MyQ app couldn't do this because it is a little confusing and they changed the wording. Uh, but you launch the MyQ app and you tap the three dots below garage door or whatever you have your garage door named and you choose notification and alerts. Then you can choose add access notification. From there, you give the access notification a name. So you might call this one still open, exclamation point. Then this is where it gets confusing because you see that there's only an option for opened, stopped, or closed. You want to choose open, and then you want to say, remind me. And you can choose how long after the garage door opens ah. that you want to be reminded. So you can say, if yours, as Rosemary did, 10 minutes, if yours is five minutes, if yours is 15 minutes, I have one set up for 15 minutes. And then you can go as far as to say, when should this notification be active? Then you can Perfect. choose 8 p.m. Uh, so I understand why it was a little, it seemed like there wasn't that option in the app itself because, yeah, they just call it opened, stopped, and closed. But when you choose opened and then you choose when, that's what tells you, okay, this is a period of time after you've opened the garage door, 15 minutes after you've opened the garage door. If it hasn't been closed again, then it will notify you to let you know that the garage door is still open. And then you can choose either push notification or email. So I will uh, close out of this because I don't want to save it. And you can see that I have two options here. Garage door is closed and garage door is still open. So when the garage door closes, you can see it immediately lets me know that the garage door has been closed because I use that whenever I leave the house to know. But I only get garage door is still open. When would you like to be notified? 15 minutes after that happens. Mm -hmm. And at any time, it lets me know that it's still open. So I'm yes, it really is pleased that there done. is a native solution for this because first of all, I personally believe that if you're going to do something security related, like a garage door opener or a lock or something, there should be an auto lock feature um, connected to all of this. That would, that, you know, that, that seems, you know, reasonable. And I'm really glad, Micah, that you have the same thing. And so you can actually demo it um, properly because that was the part that the other problem that I have, I could sign up to the MyQ app, but I don't have a garage door opener to set up. And I wasn't willing to purchase one for the garage that does not exist, let alone has a door, <laughs> does not have a right. door um, to, to test this out. So perfect that you already had one. I'm, I'm willing well, to go so far for the show, but buying an entire garage and setting up a garage door opener seemed <laughs> a little bit too far, perhaps. Rosemary bought a new house with a garage for this question. <laughs> well, and two, I, what I like is that you showed how to do it through iOS, through the, you know, the home thing, because the person did set it up. I try to just use uh, as much as I can the MyQ, I mean, the the uh, home app, but occasionally mm -hmm. you do have to use an app itself uh, to yeah. do some of those features. So yeah, occasionally you do have to go native. All right, let's take a quick break uh, before we come back with the rest of the show, including feedback and our app caps. Uh, I want to tell you about Coinbase, who are bringing you this episode of iOS 
today. If you've been looking to level up your financial portfolio, well, it's always good to diversify. So why not think about cryptocurrency? It's backed by the world's leading investors. It's Coinbase, which keeps your portfolio safe and secure while adding crypto into your mix. Coinbase offers a trusted and easy-to-use platform to buy, sell, and spend cryptocurrency. They support the most popular digital currencies on the market and make them accessible to everyone. They offer portfolio management and protection, learning resources, and a mobile app so you can trade securely and monitor your crypto all in one place. Millions of people in more than 100 countries trust Coinbase with their digital assets. Whether you're looking to diversify, you're just getting started, or you're searching for a better way to access crypto markets, start today with Coinbase. It was nice uh, on the app being able to go in and, and learn about different cryptocurrencies. I've got lots of learning material within the app. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com slash iOS. Sign up at coinbase.com slash iOS for $10 in free Bitcoin. This offer is for a limited time only, so be sure to sign up today. That's coinbase.com slash iOS. Thank you, Coinbase, for sponsoring this week's episode of iOS Today. Let's head into the feedback. Randy writes in, I have my iPhone set to silence unknown callers. If uh, folks aren't aware, there's a setting. You launch the settings app, you go into phone, and then you can choose to silence unknown callers. Uh, Randy says, I also have my iPhone setting calls on other devices turned on, allowing calls on my iPad. Calls that are not in my contacts do not ring on my iPhone. However, they do ring on my iPad. I do not understand why the call blocked on the iPhone should be sent to the iPad. It has been suggested that I create a focus only allowing calls from all contacts. How does this differ from not allowing calls from people not in my contacts? And since the focus is shared across all devices, will this mess up my phone? Thanks for your help, Randy. Randy, gotta tell you, I'm right there with you. It is rather annoying that uh, you turn on calls from iPhone on your Apple or on your phone, and then if those are unknown callers, they can sometimes uh, show up on another device. And yes, yeah, certainly mm -hmm. using Do Not Disturb or another focus will help you, but it is annoying. I had that problem with my Mac, and so I ended up just turning off that feature that let me take calls on my Mac if I wanted to because it was happening, uh, trying to happen during shows, and it wouldn't play mm -hmm. on my phone, but it would play on my Mac. And I thought, this is. Awful. This is not the user experience I asked for. No, and that's the thing. This is most definitely not the user experience that we asked for. Um, and it, at first glance, when you're looking on your iPhone, it doesn't, uh, or on your iPad rather, it doesn't look like there's a way to fix this. But I do have a little bit of a hint. Uh, that's the wrong iPhone. Uh, there we go. That's my iPad. Um, I'm having to pull down on the screen because I don't want to show everybody all of the, the contact details associated with FaceTime. But if you go into the FaceTime settings, yes, FaceTime, there's no phone uh, section in the settings uh, on your iPad. But if you go into the FaceTime settings, then first of all, you can see uh, quite a few uh, different options related to FaceTime, uh, whether or not how or rather how incoming calls are presented and so on and so forth. But there's also an option for calls from iPhone. And if you tap on that, then that's where you can toggle it on and off. But unfortunately, there don't appear to be a lot of other options, which is a real shame. Um, and I would really like to see this improve. Though I have to say, I have not personally been experiencing this problem recently. And I'm not quite sure what I've done magically to fix this. The only thing that I can think of is I've been trying out a couple of those different uh, call blocking apps that are supposed to um, uh, block uh, spam callers and so on and so forth. Um, and I found that uh, I they auto downloaded to my iPad. And when I had a call from an unknown caller the other day, um, I didn't get it um, on my iPad. I did get it on my iPhone because I actually have it enabled on my iPhone because otherwise I don't get phone calls from my doctor's surgery, um, which is very problematic because I really wish they would just call out using their their public number. They don't. <laughs> Amen. Um, but, <laughs> um, you know, uh, there is, uh, you know, so I, maybe try downloading one of those apps and put it on your iPhone as well. Now, the, the thing with that is it is like the, the settings for, for it to actually end up on your iPhone. So I'm not quite sure why it was downloading on my iPad in the first place, but that's the only difference I can see slash tell that I have compared to you two. 
um, where I've got that app downloaded on my iPad as well. I was using Haya when I was testing it out recently, um, yeah. but I know that there are lots of different ones out there. Um, so um, I use RoboKiller and that RoboKiller ended up being the thing that fixed it for me. Uh, Silence mm -hmm. Unknown Callers is great, but it's not a full featured option versus RoboKiller or Haya or another one of those, which actually goes as far as to add these different numbers to your block list, at which point then it is shared across the different devices. And so then it won't show up on, on the phone. Uh, but yeah, the built-in solution, unfortunately, is not enough to make it so that you're not getting buzzed across uh, other devices that you have the that feature turned on um so i wish we could be of more help randy but you may check out one of those apps haya uh robo killer etc that will help you uh, block those pesky callers that are always getting on our nerves all right the next one comes from larry who writes aloha from Kauai, micah and rosemary aloha to you as well uh, thank you for bringing us useful information each week my dilemma has to do with playing podcasts in my car i listen to podcasts podcasts virtually all the time while driving, here's the issue. When I finish my day and begin a new day, starting my car, it begins playing some random tune from Apple Music. Keep in mind, I never played anything other than the podcast during the night. It happens whether it's my company or personal car or whether connected via wired or Bluetooth. Making it worse, this doesn't happen all the time. It's sporadic. I've tried everything I can think of and searched the web for a solution, trying unsuccessfully the various ideas offered. I've even made it a point to have the Apple Podcast app open before I start the car. This morning, the podcast started playing, then suddenly switched to Apple Music. Music. What the heck? This has happened for quite a while and isn't a bug with iOS 15 because this happened in 14 as well. I love my Apple products and operating system, but this is upsetting me. I'm paraphrasing there. Do you have any ideas or solutions for this irritation? Mahalo, Larry. Larry, I have some bad news for you. Um, you, like many, many people across the world, are being plagued by the ridiculous software slash firmware that is the infotainment system, the automotive infotainment system. Uh, many a vehicle has a set of kind of built-in commands in place that are there to make the uh, infotainment system more automated and more useful as the person who created the, the people who created the infotainment system think. The idea that they think everybody wants is that when you plug in a device, it should immediately start playing something on the car stereo system. Unfortunately, that's not what we want. So this is what's interesting. I, uh, the way that it works in older vehicles is it goes to alphabetically the first song in your music library. And that's by song title, not by anything else. That's by song title. So it will go and find the first song. And I'm trying to, uh, that that's in your, uh, music library and start playing that. So some brilliant person came up with this idea to create a blank song for whenever you plug your phone into an infotainment system so that you have time to choose what you actually want to listen to. Here you can see in my song library, it's called A A A A A very good song with a space between the A's, making it so that it is the first thing alphabetically that appears in the music list. This A A A A A very good song is not an actual song. It is just uh, let's see how many minutes. It's um, nine minutes and 58 seconds of nothing so that when you plug in your phone, it will play that and not blast you with whatever the first song is, which otherwise it used to be a song from the musical Fun Home. <laughs> and so it would start every time and get on my nerves. Uh, but then I found the AAAAA very good song, which I will uh, include a link to in the show notes. And so you may think it's random, Larry, but I have a feeling it's probably the first song that's in your music library uh, listed by song title alphabetically. And... If it's not, then your infotainment system is a little more advanced and it's choosing some other way, but it's still playing whatever is in your library. And that's why even though it started out with that podcast, it ended up switching because that's when the infotainment system kicked in and said, hey, start playing a song from the library. So this is yeah. just 
out-of-date firmware. It sucks. It's just the way that infotainment systems works. My partner, his is even worse, where uh, whether he connects via Bluetooth or actually plugs in, it always plays something at a high level instead of like actually having the volume be at a reasonable level. So it's like always a nightmare. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of different infotainment systems that make different choices, but they're all making choices without your permission. And it's only until the most modern systems that have finally clicked and gone, oh, let's either give the person the option to choose how uh, it starts or doesn't start, or let's make it so that it's playing whatever is in the now playing section of their songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I would definitely recommend, because this is something that I was able to go in and change on my car. I uh, still have the fabulous feature where if you press on, uh, press the button that would trigger the voice assistant, uh, if you don't press it for long, you just do a press, it triggers the built into the infotainment system, absolutely rubbish, fabulously terrible um, voice assistant, which has absolutely no integration with my phone whatsoever. And I hate it. If you press and hold it, it triggers Siri, which is of course what I'm after. Um, but what you can do is have a poke around in the settings of your infotainment system on your car and you may find, fingers crossed, hoping for some magic for you, that you can disable automatic play or something like that. You're looking for a setting where it's to do with iTunes or iPod or music or play. Um, and I say iTunes or iPod because a lot of these were designed for back in the day mm -hmm. where you had an iPod that you connected to your car. Sometimes it was even through, you know, like a tape deck thing. Um, that was what people originally did. But then a lot of it, you know, it came to the point where we'll put a USB port in it and you can connect your, your iPod with a 30 pin adapter. Um, you know, back, back when we had those on iPods, it's not even more recent lightning iPods. It's, they're still thinking that people are using 30 pin iPods, which, you know, the, the iPod classic and the iPod video are still great devices, but, uh, they're, they're not the uh, most uh, modern of things. And of course, you don't necessarily want to be playing with those click wheels while you're trying to drive. But if you have a look for those settings, I was able to find one um, uh, for, for my car, which has disabled that. And one thing that I um, have done, which is a shortcut, so we're kind of leaking back into shortcuts corner here in, for my car, is this is an automation for when CarPlay connects. Uh, what I do is I have my phone wait 30 seconds, um, and then it checks if audio is playing. You can do this uh, either using a built-in action or I'm using uh, Toolbox Pro here because it's any audio. Um, and then you can play something using whatever your preferred podcast app of choices. Um, and I do this to just wait because sometimes um, I do just trigger like other things playing, frequently podcasts. Um, but uh, then if I haven't done anything after 30 seconds, then it's just going to go ahead and play that playlist for me. Um, but fingers crossed you can find something in your infotainment system settings. I really hope so. Uh, because me that too. is infuriating that you have this automatic music that you don't want. I agree. It's very annoying. So we will link to that a, 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 a very good song. So if your system is old enough and there is no option, you can try that. Um, mm -hmm. But And yes, I would combine that, I would actually suggest with the shortcut that I showed to automatically play something when you connect to uh, your car, uh, if possible. Obviously, you would need CarPlay or something for that, which is going to require a more modern vehicle. But uh, fingers crossed, uh, you can do something there. All right, uh, let's move on to our app caps. <laughs> you had the same idea. <laughs> Folks, this is the part of the show where we wear caps atop our head to honor our picks of the week. These may be apps or gadgets we're using right now or ones we've had or used for a long time that we think are great and want to share with you. Rosemary Orchard, it looks like we had similar thoughts. Tell us about the cap atop your head and your pick this week. Well, my, my cap last week was dedicated to the end of summer, as both you and I have now switched to wintertime. I was in wintertime last week. You've now joined me. Um, so, <laughs> so we're back to being slightly further apart time-wise. No ge geographical distance there. So I picked a lovely uh, sort of knit cap. It's got some ginger red people on. It's got a pom-pom. Um, and it's got some lovely, you know, sort of uh, interstitia there, which is uh, just the interweaving of colors that have been knit into it. Uh, but my pick this week is a little bit related to health and fitness and the fact that I spend a significant chunk of my day, week, life, 
at this very desk that I'm sitting at right now. Now, I do have a sit-stand desk, which has improved things when it comes to sitting down. But I don't know about you folks, but I know that I find if I'm getting into the groove of something, then as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm going to change from sitting properly like this. And bearing in mind, I've got a nice good chair here, so that helps. But I'll change from sitting properly to slightly slumping down, and then I'll be leaning over. And then before I know it, I'm doing something on my desk, and I'm actually fully leaning over. And that's really not good for your back. Um, and I had the original one of what I'm going to show here today a while ago. Um, and then uh, actually, when I was in the middle of moving countries last year, I didn't have the old one. And I realized that there is a new one of these. And this is the Upright Go. Now, it doesn't look like much. It's a little piece of plastic. Um, uh, it's got a USB-C port on it. That's the newer ones. Um, and they are around about $60. But what they do is you can turn them on and you can connect them with your phone. Um, and the connection with your phone is where this actually gets interesting because this is a gyroscope. So what it's doing is it's looking to see whether or not it's stood up or if it's uh, led or if you're, you know, slumping at an awkward or non-functional angle. So I've turned this on and you can see it's paired with the app on my iPhone. Um, and what you can do is you can actually calibrate it so that you can say, okay, but I'm sitting up properly right now and I'll calibrate it. Um, and then as you go ahead and do things like lean forwards, um, and I'm going to have to uh, play with this a little bit to try and do it because I'm obviously not wearing it right now, um, then uh, it should uh, go ahead and know. Uh, there we go. And so you can just sort of see uh, if it goes for, far enough, then it will actually say that it is not uh, sitting right and then it'll vibrate. Now, one thing I have upgraded to recently because they come with sticky pads to stick on your back. Um, I didn't really have a problem with the sticky pads per se. I'm fortunate in that my skin is, while well, somewhat sensitive, not allergic to the adhesive, but I found that they sell these necklaces which you can connect to it and it just plugs into the USB-C port that you use for charging. And then you can just pop it on your back. Um, and this is a little tricky to do because I'm wearing a hoodie and I would usually put it under that. Um, and then it should sit in about the right spot on your back. Um, and then if you lean forward, then it will actually vibrate and say, you know, I can see a countdown here and you can change this. I found 15 seconds is around about right so that I'm not getting buzzed every single time I lean down to pick something up off the floor or I lean over to grab something. But there we go. And I can actually feel this vibrating on my back. And now if I sit back up, voila. It's perfectly happy with me again. Um, and the idea is that you do training sessions every day um, to try and help train you to sit correctly. Um, and then you also have monitoring options. Um, so you can turn off the vibration for a while and it will just keep track of all this information. Um, and then you get a nice summary afterwards. Um, and I have to say, this has improved things um, as I've gone. I deliberately didn't do it today so that I could show everybody, um, you know, what it looks like wh while you're doing it. Um, but it is... Um, um, you know, something where they recommend doing this a couple of days a week. I found Monday to Friday is easy because I, I have my day job Monday to Friday. So I sit here, I work Monday to Friday and I, I use this as well. Um, and the necklace as well, I, I found is better than the adhesive, especially with summer dresses or something, you know, you don't necessarily want something sticking to your back. And it's at the point, uh, at least for some women where the neckline of what you're wearing might get into, get in the way there or stick to it or cause it to ping off. So I found the necklace was a, a good purchase with that, but I'm really liking this. It works really well. The app of course is free. There is no subscription with this. It's just a, a one-time purchase. They're about $59 uh, or you can get uh, there's a upright go two, and there's also an upright go S, uh, which is slightly cheaper, um, which you can take a look at. And the necklace has come in a variety of different colors as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, if somebody is looking to try and improve their posture, um, and keep an eye on their back fitness and health, then this is a way to do it. And I am really enjoying this. I had the original, it was good. Uh, it was micro USB and I had left it in Austria when I thought I was coming here for a weekend and ended up stuck for six months. And I liked it so much that I bought another one. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm here with it. I'm happy. Uh, it works. And I'm, I'm pleased that I have it because it does improve, um, you know, my, my life and it charges really easily. So I'm, I'm very happy with it um, and how it works. There's also a Mac app where you can connect it to your Mac um, and then you can see the, the information on your Mac as well. It syncs through your phone to your Mac. Um, so you need to have your phone around and connected to it. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there's plenty of options there. So 
I'm pleased with it. And if somebody's looking for it, and I know a couple of people recently have been asking me uh, for things uh, related to this, then uh, this this is uh, my solution. And of course, the advantage of the necklace is I can very easily take it off to show you it at the end of my app cap segment. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. And it, it's not as expensive as I thought they were. So that makes it even no, more No, no, that's the thing. The, 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 the relatively recent release of the S has made this a much more affordable device uh, for people. Those ones are $60. There's a pro, the pro bundle is uh, $80, including a, a necklace. Um, and you can choose from a variety of different colors there, or there's a complete ergonomic bundle with some extras and stuff in. Um, again, as I mentioned before with Anchor, maybe keep an eye out and see if there's a Black Friday deal on these things or if there's a discount on Amazon at some point. Um, but I've I found honestly just the actual device itself and the necklace have done exactly what I needed. And the necklace does make me more likely to wear this, which was something I was not expecting, but was pleased to find out. Nice. All right. Uh, my cap is, this is the first cap I knitted um, when I was learning to knit during the pandemic. It's an Oh, it's the yarn is called oatmeal um, and it's sort of a light tan with lots of little fun flecks inside. And yeah, that's uh, the cap I'm wearing on top of my head. The app I'm talking about is an idle clicker game called Egg Ink. Egg Ink is an app that lets you create a chicken farm uh, where you produce eggs and the more eggs you get, the more money you make to uh, fund research to improve upon your ability to make eggs, which lets you then more, grow more eggs, which lets you then make more money, which lets you make more research to grow more eggs and get bigger um, buildings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let me show you, this is the farm that I'm currently working on. I am working on a an egg called the Graviton egg. Each egg is worth $175,000. And I currently have, well, let's go into the stats here just so we can see. Um, I have 19,712,000 chickens. Uh, th my egg value for each egg is $129.6 trillion because I've done a lot of research to improve, increase the value of the egg. Um, there's, there's a, a feature called soul egg, which I won't talk about right now because that's kind of more in depth. And my chickens are currently laying 13.02 billion eggs per minute. Uh, and let's see what else. Oh, I've taken down 793 drones. So <laughs> along with growing chickens, uh, all while you're playing uh, this game, there are like what look like Amazon drones flying back and forth around your farm. And if you tap on them, you can knock them out of the air and collect whatever's inside of them. Typically, it's either money or golden eggs, which golden eggs allow you to fund certain kinds of research and use certain kinds of, um, of, of power-ups. So right now... There are a bunch of chickens inside of my buildings here. And this front area here is where the chicken or the, where the eggs get picked up and delivered to the population. Um, the idle clicker part of this game is that there's this chicken button down at the bottom. And when I tap and hold, chickens are hatched and they go into those areas where they go and make more eggs. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? In this case, it's the egg inside of the hatchery where the chickens are uh, they're hatched and then they're released into their population to make more eggs. So as long as I'm tapping and holding on that button, chickens are being released, but you see that suddenly the chickens have stopped releasing. That's because up in the top, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but there's this little, oh, now I'm getting a call. Uh, there's this little button that has uh, a little baby chick on it. And the that's the hatchery. That represents how many uh, baby chicks can be hatched. So that uh, area drops down as you press down on the chicken button to release more chickens into your population. So what you have to do is wait for that to refill. But you can also use some power-ups to make it so that the chickens are always hatching, like there's no uh, running down on the number of chickens that are coming out of the hatchery at a time. Those last for a period of like 30 minutes um, or you know less, depending on what you're doing. Now, let me show you some of the mechanics here. So one of the things I can do is I've got these four different hatcheries. Right now, I've got uh, towers as the place to store my chicken. I can store up to 42 million chickens at a time. I can upgrade my buildings to something larger, including Eggtopia and the Hab 10,000, which is 9.974 
octillion dollars or the Eggtopia, which is 2.3 nanillion dollars. Um, and upgrading I, any of those will imp will increase the number of chickens I can hold at a given time. Uh, over here in my transportation, I've currently got mega semis that are transporting eggs. Each one can transport 3.2 egg 3.2 billion eggs per minute uh you can see the utilization rate there that lets you ch lets you see i'm not using all of this uh, transportation space but if i wanted to upgrade uh the next thing is a hover semi um which will they actually float above the ground so the more chickens you get the more money you get then the more uh you can do to essentially keep producing more and more eggs the goal and because you start out with just a normal egg farm and the goal is to reach the number of eggs that they set for you to reach at which point you can sell your farm and go to the next one so it starts with a normal egg then it goes to a superfood egg then i think it goes to a medicine egg where the egg looks like a pill capsule and then on and on from there and then as soon as you fill that egg completely, you get to sell the farm and move on to the next one where you start over. There's also a prestige mechanism in this game where essentially you sell everything and start over from scratch from egg one, but in selling, you get these things called soul eggs, which are worth a lot more uh, value. It increases how much money you can make each minute. So the more soul eggs you have, the more you can earn per minute. So it is, uh, beneficial to you to uh, prestige uh, relatively regularly because then it becomes easier. Right now, I've been playing the Graviton egg for quite some time, but I can only earn so much money uh, per second. And so it doesn't, it would benefit me, it would behoove me to prestige because if I prestiged, then it adds a multiplier to how much money I can make for an egg. So by the next time I get to the Graviton egg, it won't take as long for me to get through it. Um, along with that, they add some other mechanisms to some other game mechanics to make it even more fun, including the ability to uh, plan missions and go to other places to find little uh, tools and tidbits that let you um, add to your your mechanics so to the game mechanics so for example this puzzle cube uh reduces the cost of research and this one uh, adds to my earnings whenever i'm away from the game this is one of the games that plays while you're gone you need to add uh silos to be able to collect uh, for you and feed the chickens while you are gone so that whenever you come back to the game it says hey here's how much money you made while you were gone and then you refill the silos after that so lots of different mechanics but the whole point is uh, to basically fund research to improve upon uh, the game and right now it's uh, research is 70% off. So I'm going to quickly uh, add to time compression, which increases egg laying rate by 10%. I'm going to improve upon the machine learning incubators. Um, I'm going to increase egg value by 10% by adjusting the genetic purification and add to the quantum egg storage, which increases vehicle capacity by 5%. So ultimately, this is a game where you just wait for your egg uh, levels to grow and then you get to keep making more and more and more and more eggs it is very much an idle clicker type of game and uh, there's even uh, a bonus value in holding down on the chicken button because for the number of chickens that are running you get a bonus to your overall earnings and the output that the chickens make so staying in the game and just holding your finger on that chicken button is actually uh it adds to the value of the game so there is value in increasing the um ability to produce a set number of chickens to hatch a set number of chickens at a specific time uh yeah so right now i guess for the next 24 hours there's a research sale where research is 70 percent off oh and i forgot to mention there are also what they call elite drones that fly by and these ones dodge and swerve so you have to tap on them quickly uh, before they run away uh, this is egg inc it is free to download in the App Store. There are in-app purchases, but you absolutely do not have to pay to play. Uh, the in-app purchases just give you uh, the ability to 
ha basically in-app purchases give you golden eggs, which you can use as an epic uh, area to add some different kind of boosters and things. But the game is constantly just giving you golden eggs as well, just not as many. So you can collect golden eggs within the game and use those to boost everything, to power everything. You don't have to pay to play this game. And that is why I recommended it because I have been enjoying it. I like these little resource games um, where you, you know, you get more and more and then you get to build things. Uh, but if it was just one of those stupid pay to play games, which I tried one, uh, the app store had a, a story about them. And I tried one of the other ones. It's like a coffee store game and it was terrible. Everything was pretty much in-app purchase nonsense. Uh, Egg Inc. is very much not that. It's a lot of fun if you like those games. And I really enjoy getting to come back later and play uh, these, these games. So that is Egg Inc. And this has been iOS Today. If you have questions, feedback, or maybe you have an app you want to recommend for us to try out, you can send that to iOS Today at twit.tv. Uh, we record this show live every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. You can head to twit.tv slash live to check it out live and watch us as we record or head to twit.tv slash iOS. We think that's the better way to do it because by doing so, you can subscribe to the show in its various formats, uh, subscribe to audio or video, and uh, select the one that works for you if you're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, etc. We think you should subscribe to the video show, but if you want the audio show or if you need the audio show, we do our best to make sure that this uh, show is accessible to those who are not able or are not um, desirous of, of watching. So we do try to do a good job of making sure you that the audio show is just as valuable. Uh, and I should mention, if you would like to get all of our shows ad free, well, you should check out Club Twit because for seven bucks a month, you can get every single Twit show with no ads. You also get access to the exclusive Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra content you won't find anywhere else before the show, after the show, under the show, above the show, etc. As well as access to the members only Discord server, which is a lot of fun. It's a place you can go to chat with us. It's often where folks are asking for questions, uh, shortcuts, corner stuff, etc. But we do pay attention everywhere it comes from. So don't worry about that. But you can chat with your fellow Club Twit members and others. If that sounds good to you, seven bucks a month at twit.tv slash club twit. We also heard that some folks wanted to support their favorite shows directly. And particularly those of you listening to iOS today, you may be coming to us via Apple Podcasts. For $2.99 a month, you can subscribe to the audio version of the show with no ads. So each month you pay $2.99, you're supporting iOS today directly. And in return, you get the ad-free audio version of the show, uh, all in Apple Apple Podcasts. Uh, Rosemary Orchard, if folks want to follow you online and check out all the great work you're doing, where do they go to do so? Best place is rosemaryorchard.com, which has links to all the things I do all around the internet. Um, and of course, you can also find me on Twitter at Rosemary Orchard. Micah, where can people find you? You can find me at Micah Sargent on many a social media network or head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I am most active online. Thank you, folks, for tuning in to iOS Today. We appreciate you, and we will see you next week. Goodbye. Hi, Ron. So you got yourself the brand new latest and greatest iPhone or Samsung smartphone because you heard about all of the beautiful photography those things can create. But for some reason, you're just not quite getting it done with when you try to make your photos. Or you got yourself a brand new camera because you were interested in getting started in photography. But eh, your little new inexpensive camera still isn't quite cutting it. Well, you need to check out my show hands-on photography here on Twit. I'm going to show you how to be a better photographer and a better post-processor and quite frankly, just help you get the most out of that new camera that's, that's either on your phone or the brand new one that you just got for your, your birthday or gifts or what have you. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So head on over to twit.tv hop. That's twit.tv hop and subscribe today. <laughs>